Okay, here we go. So go right ahead. All right. Uh, so, Paul. Um, Why don't you introduce this, yourself a little bit? Because we've never met. Sure. My name is Kyle McNeese, and I'm a researcher, and I am in the field of communication and bioethics. And so I focus on sort of underlying substrata um, that we sort of rely on in order to do what we're doing right now. So I look at the, the sort of technical aspects of that, but then also the the more fundamental aspects, the primordial aspects that, you know, brain-based things that allow us to communicate in general. So um, the bioethics part we could get into, but <laughs> I do, I, I spent time in the developing world and uh, it's a little pertinent right now because there's an outbreak of dengue fever that's, that's hitting Central America, in particular Honduras, very hard. And so while I was living there, I got, I was fortunate enough to get multiple strains. And so it, it sort of increases with lethality the more strains you encounter. So yeah. they had to uh, send me out of the country. And so yeah. all of the students, people that I love, they couldn't get on a flight and leave. And so yeah. almost everyone that I knew knew someone that had died from a vector-borne disease or something much worse. And yeah. so um, it it hit me right where I lived. And so yeah. whenever I study ethics, it's it's usually from an applied perspective. How does this affect real people where they live? Um, so um, I didn't come in, into academia for... You know, just just curiosity. I came with a little bit of a uh, my own ethical purpose, and so uh, some of that was trying to get needed supplies, drugs, things of that nature to to people that were in desperate need. So um, a lot of great people out there doing work, and so whenever I heard your story, of uh, there's a lot of similarities. Um, between you said you know sort of a lineage your grandfather your father you all doing pastorate work and same thing with with my family they came here as immigrants to start a church to uh, experience some religious liberty and freedom to worship and so in in so doing um, even though my parents were from vastly different worlds they ended up meeting through this this church and that sort of was my life. Mm -hmm. And um, whenever you mentioned you had done mission work as well and experienced cultures outside of our own, I felt, you know, a lot of resonance there, but then the most important thing I think, um, and this may be the crux of what I really want to talk to you about is I hear you being able to address questions that I hear daily from students, clients, that most of the pastors that I deal with and have known in my life just aren't willing to take on and you do it explicitly. So I think in some ways what you're doing is more and less difficult than what say someone like Jordan Peterson is doing because you take on the metaphysical claim. So when Peterson says, who dares say they are a believer, <laughs> Well, Paul Vanderclay says he is a believer, and you can be one too. <laughs> but I'd love to start for a moment at, at what some people think is a failure. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say that the, the Harris-Peterson debate on facts was a failure. And I don't, I don't see it that way at all because in talking with students, so in our large theory class, there's usually a couple hundred students in there. And they're not kids, but they're not quite fully formed adults either. They're, you know, 20 years old, something like that. And um, they get to write a theory paper that they can apply to some real world situation. I have found that over the years, and this is increasingly so, a majority of the class write about how their home um, being broken has affected them and their experience of, of what, what kind of person I'm trying to be in the world. It affects their self-esteem. As a pastor, you will have counseled many families who go through that. It's absolutely heartbreaking. And 
people may not think that even at that age, they're still wrestling with these issues, but going off from home for the first time, not having um, that sense of an anchor that they can rely on at home, yep. that, that kind of chaos really does affect them in a profound way. And then the next thing would be that they're experiencing a loss of faith. And so whenever they write these papers, of course, whenever they, they get into details that they're willing to share something like that, and I'll you know, write some notes to them. This is a great paper. Why don't you come by the office and we'll talk about it. And so the theme that I feel like has emerged from those conversations is when I'm dialoguing with them, so tell me why you think you're, you're losing your faith. Um, and they would say, well, I want to believe, but in my philosophy of science class, I'm taking this class from one of the leading evolutionary theorists in the world. And when I go to my pastor and I say, he's telling me this is the theory of evolution. And my pastor says, you know what, write down whatever you have to write down on a test to get an A, but don't listen to him. You know, this, the Bible is the Bible. <laughs> and solely so, like, don't listen to your professor, listen to your, you know, your pastor, your congregation. And, and going back to the, the debate between Harris and Peterson, see, what I think we're dealing with here is that students are coming up against a reality like this supercomputer that I'm holding in my hands. This is a fact that they can wrap their heads around. There's a materiality here that's tangible, it's real. And as much as they might want to deny it, I don't know why you would want to deny an iPhone, you know, maybe for ethical reasons, you know, you might want to deny that, that people would exploit others or tech, you know, just to build a technology, but you wouldn't say that it doesn't exist. So they can really put their hands on something like that. And there's a connection there. And they would say that they got there through brute facts via science and technology. So if you pit that against the fact that they will have never, unless they had an unusual spiritual experience, seen God, except for in their brother, whatever they think that means. You know, <laughs> uh, but that's just, you know, inherently it's, it's a kind of selfish time in your life. So you may not be as worried about your brother, whoever he or she is, um, out there in the world, or I should say brother or sister. Um, but how, how do you see God? How do you experience God? These narratives from 2,000 years ago, what kind of relevance do they have in my life today? I'm not really sure, but I know that all of the people in my life, whenever I go to them and tell them the questions that I have, they react out of fear. And then that just drives me into a place of quietude where I feel very isolated. And it gets so gripping for them because simultaneously there are writers who will address it, this issue. And they say, well, it's because there is no God. It's because there is no such thing as this, this guy, Jesus, or if they at least exceed, they give you that much. They say, maybe there is, but he's some historical figure. Um, you know, Josephus has a few lines about him. So that's about the best we can do. But even if he was real, why would you listen to him today? So what, what Harris does there, I think, is, is shrewd rhetoric in that he's able to posit this, there are these brute facts about the world, and then there are these nebulous ideas that we have about God. And even when Peterson reads him his own definition of God, he says, that's not really God. So in some ways, he's more of a fundamentalist than a fundamentalist, and that's a really interesting thing. And so by knocking over that, that toppling over the fundamentalism aspect, it is hitting a lot of students. And maybe you can help me figure this out. My wife and I were talking about this, and she and I were raised a little bit differently, where I sort of had a trinity but then like a subspecies to the Trinity. So this is God the Father, God the Son, 
Holy Spirit. And then the Bible is sort of, it's not, <laughs> quite, it's not quite at the level of the Trinity, but it, if you, <laughs> if you question it in any way, then you're, you're out of the fold. And so um, one of my friends, um, when I was studying at Oxford, he, he was studying theology under um, one of the best theologians in the world. And so uh, they invited me to go to dinner with them because I didn't know very much about the Catholic faith at all. And so the, the priest had been raised as a Baptist. And so we were talking about symbolism and the Bible. And he tells me, he said, you know, I grew up, people would say, this is all just symbol. Nothing to see here but symbol. However, if you do it wrong, you eat and drink damnation to your soul. So he's like, how do you, how does a symbol become lethal? I don't know. Um, so that's about the extent to which some of us uh, thought about symbolism is like, there is this sim symbolic aspect, but then it's deadly serious, like no pun intended. Um, whereas my wife, she, she never really had any questions arise in her faith because of someone saying, well, this could be interpreted metaphorically. Um, it didn't impact the, the truth claims in the Bible in any way. So it wasn't as if she had a Trinity plus like this, this book was the only material thing that you could hold on to in the faith. And so I find that, you know, in my own personal life, I can understand some of where this, this comes from. And then when you enter a rigorous academic program, your master's, your PhD, by the time you've done that, you've spent, depending on what your program is, you know, 12 years of your life being inundated. And I can even remember times in my life where I looked at her and said, geez, you know, I don't, I don't want to be an atheist. They're making a really compelling case, though, that this is just the fact that you would take the Bible and say, well, there's any number of books that if you just scroll through them, even textbooks from the 50s, they're more accurate than the Bible as far as cosmology goes. Therefore, you should throw the Bible aside. There's nothing good to see here. I find that my students are still having to wrestle with those kinds of questions because if you say to them, well, their writers didn't intend for this to be modern cosmology. And they're writing in a particular milieu, um, contrasting themselves against other you know, peoples who had their own stories and narratives about their deities. Um, it really is, in some ways, a compelling ar argument. I at least find it compelling. And that it's naively compelling but nonetheless, um, in, in this day and age where things are, are very tactile, um, this lingering question of, of, well, then where is God? You know, how do you, how can you find him? Um, has he appeared to you? If so, um, you know, when God talks back, you, you know, people say, if you talk to God, you're a religious person. If he talks back, you have a mental illness. So, <laughs> You know, I think that, that we really, people are hard on millennials, but in a way we've created this, this catastrophe of nihilism and then a church almost universal that has been unwilling to engage them at the level that they're at and take these questions seriously. I ask pastors all the time, what are you going to do about AI? And it's like this company I was working with when I first graduated from my undergrad. I said it, their, their whole model for delivering health care was based on the Affordable Care Act not passing. <laughs> so, <laughs> Oops. <laughs> what's your plan if it does pass? And they're all like, hey, look at this guy. He's fresh out of, you know, he's so naive. It'll never pass. And I was like, but that's not a business model. <laughs> I mean, hoping something doesn't happen isn't a business model. So, you know, I, I don't really know, for them, they, the students will tell me, well, if I can't believe it at the level of the cosmology, then what is the purpose of it? What, what am I doing engaging with the Bible at all? And so 
I've said a lot. I sh let you use. Ah, oh, you speak stuff. well. I, 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 I think you put this together in a very, in a very articulate and compelling way. I appreciate that. I, I just, but someone like yourself, who's, who's no doubt dealing with, see, I, I love the approach that you're taking. You're, you know, you're, you're walking this tightrope where you're engaging a lot of people that, that they can't yet find themselves able to commit to faith. But there is this phenomenon for whatever Peterson has done, whether you think he's good or bad, I was talking with John Verveke, he, he's friends with them. And even he would say, you know, this is part of, you don't have to agree with every single thing a person says. And part of what we need to be doing is modeling what it would look like when we do disagree. Um, so that's another reason why the debate between Harris and Peterson wasn't a failure. Because no fight broke out, no, you know, no fisticuffs were thrown. They, they disagreed. And then they came back and they did it again and they reached a, a bit of a higher plane. And so even in areas where you and I might disagree, we can, we can have a rapprochement where, where we can say, here we agree, here we disagree, but it doesn't need to, to rise to the level of a 10. Like we, you know, roll up your sleeves, Pastor Vanderclay, it's time to, you know, it's, it's time to get this thing cool. Um, and so I, I worry about that. You know, we, academics, priests, rabbis, we have, uh, I think, a mandate. Not everyone agrees with this. So this is something I'm putting on top of whatever it is that we do vocationally. But I'm saying I think we have an ethical um, mandate to at least know what it would look like to be a good citizen. So that when we have these moments of discussion and debate, we can at least leave intact physically and mentally and you can come back the next day and pick up the conversation so um you're having to do it with the congregation who you know you get to speak christianese to um but then some people might say well i with you right now and so person has allowed at least for academics and people who are in in the university to start to say, at least to use one of their words, problematizing this question how simple we've made this narrative of the West is just one long story of patriarchy. Uh, it's just not that simple. And if you think it is, leave the country for a while, go is much harder you would see that even that is much better than what our ancestors ancestors throughout the ages would have had and you start to come to grips with my god this whole thing is so precarious yeah it should yeah. have never been able to happen yeah. yeah and somehow here we are we we appear to live in a universe where the things that are most improbable do happen because you and I have happened. And, you know, there's by some Talib about the black swan. And there's nothing more black swanish about life than our own. It's just the fact that we're here. But I say that I just. So all of the things that can go wrong, you know, one thing that can go right. And that's, you know, the on time and intact. But there's innumerable things. So, you know, the whole thing is just extremely serious. And so I've heard you use the word that, man, I, I don't think I've, I've read the word since and heard someone else use it in, in an actual sense. Well, maybe this is the providence of God. People don't even... Use that more because it it sort of suggests that we're not in control that that this thing is not up to us after all. Um, but you also you're, you're sort of speaking to these 
these individuals who might not be able to tolerate what we've learned to accept as the provenance of at least their list of you, at least their list and a host of other people like Verbeke and Jonathan Peugeot. And for whatever ill have happened in society, look at these great voices that have emerged and the technologies that have allowed. I mean, how long have you labeled in ministry reaching, you know, I know what it is to, to grow up in a smaller church in the middle of nowhere. I have, you know, my great, great grandparents minister there, my grandparents on down to, to my, myself. Never more than of highs uh, of 80 to 100 people there, and that'd be for like Easter. You never see those people ever again for the rest of the year, which is, you know, that's fine. But, you know, like a group of 40 people, 60 people trying to do life together. And so now you find yourself having <laughs> conversations with yokels like myself, but then also guys like, where did Jonathan Pajot come from? <laughs> have you got labored just doing the necessary thing for year after year and then suddenly you make it about you know this phenomenon what's going on here and your likes and subscribes suddenly start going up yeah. uh, it's, it's a, a bizarre phenomenon right yeah yeah it is although you know it's that's always the way life has been. If you read stories, your, your videos, your videos breaking up, it's sort of unstable, but I, I, I was able to catch the gist of most of what you said. Um, it's life has always had that strangeness of selection where, you know, Augustine is the bis Bishop of Hippo and, you know, Augustine and Jerome live at the same time in the world and Jerome writes the Vulgate and Augustine becomes the theologian of the West. It's just strange, strange, strange the way history rolls out. And, you know, I think, you know, I really, I think you articulated very well the, the challenge that many students in the West are facing and the dissonance, you know, it's one of the things that I've learned through this, this journey has been we have a real problem with time span in mm -hmm. that everything in our society has conditioned us to find solutions quickly, easily, and solutions that are applicable. You know, what is the medical standard for for a drug it has to be safe and effective right yeah. well the kinds of things we're the kinds of things we're dealing with uh, there there is no safe and there's a lot of marginally effective and so what we've seen is sort of this cycle where okay so you so everybody throws off everybody throws off all of this religious belief and then a lot of other things function as religions underneath the surface for them, but because they're really not very good religions, they, you know, they, they don't function well in people's lives, and that then has manifestations in their practices. And, and I, think, I think part of what we've seen in divorce, you know, where, where you began in this conversation, is, is one of the best examples of that. And, you know, if you sit down with an unhappy couple, um, and I've, had, I've been on both sides of that table, um, <laughs> if you sit down with an unhappy couple, you very quickly realize, well, these two people have all kinds of, these two people have all kinds of very legitimate reasons to end this union. And, you know, these are very legitimate reasons. And it could very well be that if, if the goal that we have is some sense of ratio of personal happiness to time spent, maybe splitting and finding someone else, that's the better way. Yeah, okay. Once you add children into that mix, 
all of the math is different and and to such tremendous degrees and and the fact that the the curve on on the the divorce rates in this country you know it was in the 70s that this thing sort of ramped up now, that doesn't that's not too crazy when you think of all the people that got married in the 50s as a function of now what we know about trauma and soldiers and the Second World War. I mean, if you just look at the history of the 20th century, even in the United States, which has had, which had just a dramatic, you know, a dramatically wonderful fortune in many ways for the middle to the end of the 20th century, even if you just look all, at all this stuff with what we know, you'd say, well, that, that rise in divorce rates, that, that's, that's hardly a mystery, given what we know happened in the 1940s and 50s. And, then, um, and now, given what we know, well, the, you know, these young people coming into the world with you know, issues in their trust foundations well, that's hardly a mystery, right? What we know, and and what's so amazing to me, as I've been learning from Jordan Peterson and John Verveke and doing all this work that I've been doing for the last couple of years, is that what we so quickly do is we forget psychology for the sake of our religion. Now, this is easy to understand if you've been deeply embedded in a conservative church environment, which, especially for the latter part of the 20th century, really until, you know, people, the likes of Larry Crabb came along, Christians and evangelicals, conservative Protestant people in America were very suspicious of psychology, wouldn't go to therapists. You know, Larry Crabb comes along and suddenly, you know, evangelical churches have therapists on staff, so on and so forth. They, saw, they kind of made peace with psychology to a degree. But what's been interesting is that as these, and I think John Verveke puts it together quite well, as these pseudo-religions have developed underneath, and of course, Peterson and Verveke kind of use different terminology, but they're really talking about similar things. As these pseudo-religions underneath kind of take hold, well, now suddenly these religious groups now they're not calling them religions you know they're they're calling it politics or they're calling it ethics or they're calling it morality or they're sure. calling it progress but as these pseudo religions take hold well they too now are starting to suppress um <laughs> psychology or sure. science or all these other things and you know this is sort of how i before i found peterson i was noticing these things and this is sort of how i got into this stuff because it was like these people who have overtly, explicitly rejected religion are acting so religious in all the dysfunctional ways I've seen church people do for decades. Sure. Sure. And it's like, wait a minute, <laughs> what's going on here? And I'm not religious. You sure act like you're religious. You sure yeah. act like you have a system, a foundational system of moral and ethics, but but as Peterson and Verveke both, I think, say very articulately, yeah, but your religion really is stupid. <laughs> Pointing to all these other people that you say their religion is stupid, and yeah, they've got some stupidity in their religion, but at least as a kernel of their religion, they actually have a whole bunch of battle-tested ideas that, yeah, they've got some They've got some really dumb ideas about a whole lot of things, and I'm not going to get specific with that, sure. but they've got a whole bunch of dumb ideas about a whole lot of things, but you know what? They're usually not terribly consistent with their dumb ideas, which is really a good thing, and a lot of the other ideas that are at the foundation of their religion that have been so battle-tested through the kind of contexts of suffering that make us look like wimps. Yes, absolutely. That these ideas are actually so sound and so commonsensical. They're not, they're not the spirit of geometry. They're not, oh, if you get married, then you'll be happy and your kids will do well. Uh, no, if you get married and stay married, chances are good you're not going to make a lot of the really painful mistakes 
that are so easy to grab onto, but so devastating in the far longer run because of the way that these practices and beliefs that have been encoded into moral maxims that communities have reinforced together, um, you know, there was wisdom in that, that in this weird mixture of anti-religiosity and embrace often of the only, only the convenient aspects of the sciences we wish to grab onto, well, that's become a pretty lethal, that's become a pretty lethal concoction for a generation now. And that generation is starting to get old enough because again, we're all on this curve. So the sufferings you had as a kid when yeah, dad got away from mom and then mom had a new boyfriend and dad had a had a girlfriend that was just a few years older than my sister. <laughs> and you know, and well, everybody said nice things and played nice, and if they had enough money, we got nice presents under the tree. But and those are the people we kind of saw on TV. We didn't see the people on TV that was what you know, Chris Arnett calls back row America, which is a really big group of people it's a who big group. have been actually living this way for a long time. And then people, I love that Chris Arnett, Arnett book because he, he looks at this and says, coming out of kind of front row America, why are all these people religious? Is it because they're dumb? Yeah, we always kind of thought they were dumb because they never got good grades in school. But you know, it's just beginning to dawn on a bunch of really smart people that there's wisdom built into human traditions and practices that maybe they should think about a little bit. And again, it comes, I, I can understand the, given the, the nature of the quasi-religious ideas of the moment, why people listening to a guy like Jordan Peterson say, oh, he's a conservative. Yeah, you know, <laughs> he's in the United States spectrum, he's kind of sort of a moderate Democrat, really. Um, sure. But it's because they're just, people just aren't seeing clearly and not thinking things through. And, and then what you, I mean, it's very interesting the way the new moments in the culture war have kind of borne out that psychologists were sort of on the, the bleeding edge of the left for so long now suddenly find themselves the bleeding edges over here. And, and many of the really good psychologists are and social scientists are beginning to say, Hey, wait a minute. Uh, there's this little thing called data and it's really, it's real. And it used to be this religious group of people over there were resisting us. Now there's this group of people over here that are really giving us a lot of heat. And they say they're not religious. And we used to be sort of political allies with them. But, and, and so now nobody quite knows where the boundary lines are. Because, well, here we are. Man, oof. that is, that's a hot take. I mean, there's so much there that... Um... Let me first start by laying some cards on the table. So if someone shows up in a black SUV, you know, I'm not homicidal, suicidal. I don't have any, you know, wishes to, to die. I'm a safe driver. I wear my seatbelt. Um, so, so I guess if you were to, to say one thing, you know, what's your claim to fame thus far in your life as, as a academic while I was, um, finishing my PhD in my, my master's program, I did sort of a, a combination of cross-cultural communication and psychotherapy. And so we would go to the Pacific and again, when people think of say like Hawaii, a picture might come to your mind. Oh, it's a paradisal island, you know, but uh, at the time where we went, their service delivery system was just in shambles. And so it was kind of trying to figure out what can we do here? And there was, I think that it, it more than almost any other real time experience I had, 
in academia that that experience changed my life because you're working for with and for people that had drifted in on a piece of wood didn't know any language that that anyone could understand didn't know anything about anything but needed help and working through that um so the social service system, they would call people out, say, we need these, these people investigated because they're abusing their children. And when you get there and you start dialoguing with them, what it is is the parents would have the children eating off the dirt. They weren't making them eat dirt, but their belief system was that the earth itself is like a maternal God. And so the closer you can get to her, the better off you are. And so they thought they were doing their children an immense service by teaching them this and reinforcing it. And from the perspective of, you know, the Western mind to who's in charge of going and investigating and saying what's culturally appropriate and inappropriate, that to them looked a little bit like abuse. And so, you know, once you, once you start disentangling these things um, and learn about those practices, it really then informs how you deal with, with people and the kinds of things that would be resonant in practice. You know, these are the things you'd, you'd want to talk about. These are things that are taboo. Um, and so working there, it, it really did change my perspective and, there was this, like this excursion that we got to take, and I'm trying to write about this right now, and and I'm trying to have this conversation with people that are smarter than me, wiser than I am, to to figure out how I can put this into words. And so I was talking with Verveke about this, that when when I was there, I'm not an emotional person by nature. I just I don't cry a lot. Um, it's just it's not. I feel a lot, but I don't outwardly manifest that. And so um, we got to go to Mauna Kea, so it's, you know, an extinct volcano. And you're up above the clouds, which is already weird because, you know, on ground level, you know, you're wearing a tank top and some shorts. And no one wants to see you wearing what I'm wearing right now. <laughs> this is just a, absurd. Um, so you get up there and you're above the clouds, it's freezing cold. And then as night is ushered in, you get to go to the observatory and you look through these telescopes and you see things that you can't imagine. And I saw the rings of Saturn and I just started bawling. I was just like, oh God, it's so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> there must be a God. Yeah. And my wife is, she's so confused because of all things, you're looking through a telescope, just blabbering. And as soon as I could, I called my parents and I said, thank you so much. Mm. And I was crying really hard. And they were like, what do you, what do you, what is wrong? What happened? <laughs> How much money do you need? <laughs> um, and so I, I told them, I was like, no, I just, I just saw like the, the rings of Saturn. And my mom was kind of like, what are you talking about? And I was like, I'm, I'm on the top of a volcano. The clouds are underneath us and there's no light. There's no light pollution. And so the visibility is unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. And so there's this thing above me, this sky, these stars, they've always been there, but I couldn't perceive them. And it's because of whatever you want to call it, civilization, smog, smog thought smog, whatever. I, I know that the more Christian you are, you might say the, the mind blinding power of Satan, something like that, <laughs> whatever you know, term you would feel comfortable using. It's this inability to see something that's foundational and that people have used for thousands of years to get where they're going to 
navigate them, to orient them to time, place, season. Um, we wouldn't have existed had they not been careful, um, studious about the stars. And so my father was, he was one of the um, group of individuals that he was a nominee for going up in the Challenger. And so he was a big NASA guy my whole life. And so, you know, I was crying because I got to see it. I was also crying because they had made sacrifices that allowed me to see it. And by making them meant they would never see it. Yeah. And so it was this, you know, if I could let you borrow my eyes for a minute, you wouldn't believe it. Um, and so there's this, this thing about perception, I guess is, it's a long way of, of getting to this notion that I think what we've done is, is the opposite of what they have going on there in Hawaii, where they have ordinances controlling light pollution. And it's not just for the sake of the observatory. The observatory benefits from the fact that culturally, this is something that's very important to a long heritage of night navigators. By, by ocean, they would pay attention to the sun. And when people, scientists, didn't believe that these Polynesian navigators were able to do it, they have done it by stars, navigating immense distances. And so I think what we've done is we've put this, this substrata in between people and the thing that's transcendent. They, they don't even know that it's there. And if it is there, they can't connect with it because of all this pollution that's in the way. And so part of what I think I'm trying to do is say, what you just said is, if you haven't experienced immense suffering yet, you will. And as Jordan Peterson would say, you know, you need to get your house in order. But there is this very real sense that if divorce as bad as it was for you, at some point in your life, you will realize at the individual level of consciousness, you're alone. Your, your parents can't die for you. Like they, they can sacrifice themselves for you but they themselves can't take on your death. And so we've had a kind of disappearance of death, a denial of death in the West. Whereas when I was in the developing world, whenever you get something like dengue and kind of looks, there's, there was a discussion that would go on like, is he just a weak gringo or is this <laughs> imorarico? Like, is he going to die? We don't know because we don't really know where he's from. Is he tough enough? But my friends would come by and they would just say, hey, you look all right. You know, I think you're going to make it. <laughs> Some of them would be like, man, you kind of look like my cousin. My cousin didn't make it. So, you know, do everything the doctors tell you. Yeah. And I had this, this, this experience of feeling like, dear God, it's really a coin flip for them. Like they're looking at my life. And my life to them is literally a coin flip. I could live, I could die. Not, I'm not saying that it wasn't a big deal to them. But what I'm saying is it was such a part of their lives. Whereas here in the States, we try to do everything imaginable to save that life. Yeah. Versus in a third world hospital, I was asking like, ¿Qué es este? like, what are you, like, what are you giving me? And they would just say like, um, this is calcium. There's no way it was calcium. I know it wasn't calcium, but I, they did the best that they could for me and I lived. Yeah. Um, and that's all that I could ask. Yeah. But the way that we perceive things here in the States, it, in, in the West more generally, I think that it is getting in the way of this thing that's been so clear to people throughout the history of humanity. Um, when, you know, if you believe the standard account, which even Thomas Nagel and some of his companions are starting to say, the neo-Darwinian account, it hasn't made room for consciousness. We don't, we don't really know what's going on there, but even if we just came up through apes, 
like Chesterton said, there's not a point at which you see an ape drawing, you know, he's, he's holding a stick, scraggling something along the wall, and then along comes a human hand and takes over and makes art. It's, it's not that narrative. We've been looking up our entire existence and something has happened to us where we no longer look up. We, and I guess the metaphor of the sky is just, it's one that, I mean, we have so much light pollution. It seems obvious to me that whenever I ask my students, I was like, when's the last time you, you went and looked at, a, at the night sky? They look at me like I have horns growing out of my head. And they're like, why would I do that? Like, what, what's the benefit of that? Well, there may not be any benefit, but humans have been doing it for a really long time. And I'm not saying that just because we've done it for a long time means we should perpetuate. I'm just saying it's something that's so ubiquitous that we miss it. And something that people like you and Jonathan and Verveke and Peterson seem to be able to do is a little bit like what I see comedians do when they take something that you've sort of known your whole life, but then the way they say it, it hits you and you're like, I should have, that should have been very obvious to me that that thing was absurd or this thing made way more sense than I thought it did. Um, and so I think that you guys are, are able to kind of speak to this, this visual agnosia where you're talking about people are acting in religious ways. If you're dealing with a patient who has visual agnosia, you give them an apple and you say, describe the apple. It's, uh, it's red, it's, it's round, it kind of has this little brown thing coming out of it and there's a little green thing attached to it. Uh, can I comb my hair with it? Like they can describe the apple. What what's agnosia? So uh, I mean, I understand the Greek of it, but I don't know. Yeah. So <laughs> it's this inability to. You can't identify the thing that you know. Like they know what it is. They've actually described to you what an apple is, huh. but they don't know that this is an apple. And so it's you know it it's when the temporal lobe is affected in such a way you get. Things like cortical blindness, which more people are familiar with, but then a far more intriguing case is the like the visual agnosia. You can't rem you can't remember the thing. I mean, this has its roots probably. If you wanted to analyze it, like Verveke, you could go all the way back to Plato. You could go back to Socrates and talk about their emphasis on remembering. You know, this is that's that's sort of the the point of of doing dialogue like this is so that you could remember the phenomenal world, the noumenal world, and how far you've fallen. Because you're just going to keep living this thing until you're able to get up where like ultimate reality is. But in a practical That's an sense, interesting thing, though, because you say, well, they can describe it, but they don't know it's an apple. And right, right there, you're at the middle of, you know, the, the whole Verveke, Aristotle thing okay, well, you're at, the, you're at the fight between, you know, Plato and Aristotle. Um, what is an apple? And, you know, Peterson, well, it, it, it depends if you act like it's an apple. Well, <laughs> and, you know, no, that's, that's, a really, that's a really terrific, that's a really terrific illustration. They can describe it, but they don't know it's an apple. And when you just use the word apple, suddenly you and I connect in and you know part of the big the big project that i'm working on is to try and figure out what is materiality what role does matter play in the drama because you and i we can say well they don't know it's an apple but you and i both have at least what both of us feel to be a connection via this thing apple even though there's not a physical apple between us yeah, it's, 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 it would be different if we said they don't know it's a unicorn. Because yeah. you and I have had apple that is something that we share, whereas unicorn is not something that we share. And even to describe the difference between those two realities, um, so anyway, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. You keep going. No, 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 that's good. <laughs> and I, I mean, I'm, I'm riffing off what you, you said about people, Verve, keep talking about, like, there are these, these 
autodidacts, these, you know, these many religions that are, that are popping up. And if you ask them, is this a religion? It's like asking them if it's an apple. You, you say, what do you do? Well, we have tenants. We have, you know, an organizational meeting. We have a biweekly newsletter. Um, we ask for your support, donor support. We'll even send you a T-shirt or, you know, something like that that you can pick. Um, but um, we have strict laws about purity and um, what counts as sacred to us. And we have blasphemy laws. If you say the wrong thing, um, and you know, blasphemy is, you know, at least in the Christian world, that this, that's the one you can't come back from. And so there's no way back. Is it a religion? No, it's red, it's round. It has this brown thing coming out of it. It has a little, uh, if they knew what, you know, how to call it a leaf, a leaf coming out, but it, can I comb my hair with it? I said, <laughs> so maybe this is a religion. No, but can I comb my hair with it? Um, that's that's sort of the phenomenon that we're dealing with. And I remember as a as a young guy being in in church uh, when one Sabbath and and the pastor he's he's saying you know there was this concept of my utmost for his highest and he said you guys have totally inverted this thing you've turned it into his utmost for my highest so <laughs> that's a great line i gotta steal that <laughs> um, so we've inverted what faith looks like and what what i see um and look i totally get it because life is hard it is full of suffering i'm not saying it's only suffering but it is full of it and there is malevolence, and then there's just stupidity as well. Like some <laughs> things happen because people are bad at what they do, they're incompetent. Some things happen because people are truly evil. Um, some things happen because um, it's a day ending in a Y, you know, and, and sort of picking through which that is, it's, it's hard to do. Sometimes when it's stupid, you know, <laughs> but, you, you know, lo looking at this thing and, and being honest about how hard it is, I could see where you would pick and choose elements from classical, yeah, classical thinkers who would, who would put forward things like um, stoicism. I mean, there's a return to so stoicism right now. Yeah. Okay, well, which is go, fascinating. It's it's extremely fascinating, you know, Epicureanism, all of these great things. Um, but the one of the ones that I find truly interesting, and I don't mean disrespect to anyone, because I grew up as a byproduct of this era of as Christians, we were taught like you need to tolerate everyone's position and what what interestingly happened with the postmodern flip on that is right except everyone is right except for the person who claims to be exclusively right um and it's well that sounds like you're excluding someone uh, <laughs> this doesn't this doesn't make any sense at all everyone is equal except for the person who says we're more equal um i get that we need to draw from these great traditions but I, I'm definitely not pointing this at Verveke, but there are other thinkers and atheists out there who, it seems to me, have hijacked, maybe that's a terrible word, that's an inflammatory word, I shouldn't use that. They have used practices from other religions. Um, so a famous case for me is, as a sports fan, you've got coaches who they're using Buddhist practices so that they can win more basketball games. I mean, there's, there's few things that I can think of and, you know, Phil Jackson, you're on the West coast. So you, you know, you will have, you know, he was Phil Jackson and the Lakers were the great nemesis of the Sacramento Kings in the little window. They were good. <laughs> well, so, you know, Phil Jackson, all of a sudden he becomes, you know, he's not just a coach anymore. He's a monk out there among men. And he's zinned up 
and he's zenning out his team, and all of a sudden the triangle offense works because he's gotten down to the insights of what, what Buddha really meant uh, how to beat your competitor, how to em embrace um, the fact that you should have no desires and empty yourself of everything except winning. Um, <laughs> That's right. Except the, the one desire that motivates the NBA as a multi-billion dollar operation. We'll right. let that one pass. I mean, <laughs> can you imagine Gandhi dunking on someone for millions of dollars? Can you imagine? And then trash talking. <laughs> yeah. Put Buddha in that context. And so I do find that fascinating, just like people will point out the contradictions within Christianity and using Christ as a symbol for things that are Prosperity antithetical. Gospel. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, Jesus died so you could have that Lexus, or at <laughs> least so the pastor could have one. <laughs> that's, that's important. You should be judged on the kind of car your pastor is driving because after all, Jesus's coat was seamless. <laughs> so you know, I don't know how many times I've heard that, but that's that is a an example of prosperity. I'm like, he was living in first century Palestine. There's not even a comparison to the kind of Uber world that we live in right now, where you can have any food, any beverage, almost anything that you can think of delivered to you. If not immediately, if you live in a big city, then at least over a couple of days. And Jeff is going to make sure Amazon gets that stuff to you. And so that, that in, in and of itself changes time, changes your perception of time um, and materiality. You've got your, your work cut out for you because my grandmother, um, she did, she helped uh, during World War II. She did a lot of the um, phone work, the operator work. And, you know, she would, tell us these stories about how they were trained to speak a certain way and so that people could, you know, often the lines were garbled. So you had to be, you had to enunciate very carefully. And so she would tell us these wild stories of what that was like. And then as, you know, almost eons have gone by in a matter of 50 and 60 years. So as she was approaching 90, she's on Facebook and she asked my, my wife and I one day, what is a wall? What is a Facebook wall? And this is before Jordan Peterson was anywhere on the map. And I remember sitting there and I wanted to answer her question fully, but then also do it simply. And so I looked at my wife and I was like, what is, what is, a, what is a wall? Okay, so it's, it's a thing it's a place it's a space you you write things on it you wait a minute none of that is true really like it's zeros and ones it it's it's not material in that sense it's not like any wall that you would have known of just like windows as an operating system isn't like the thing you look out and you know see through um but you didn't explain skeuomorphism to grandma? Grandma, let's talk about skeuomorphism. Yeah. Right. And so you find yourself in this world where, where I, don't, I don't buy this notion that we were, never, we were never not modern. Yes. Yes, we were. There were times when we were not modern. That's just, it's a naive thing to say and think because it shows that we have an, an immense amount of hubris. And I do think that for whatever hubris Peterson may, may demonstrate in his own life, that's between he and his maker, or <laughs> if he can't go that far, you know, his archetypal, hierarchical, <laughs> you know, I, the, god acts, the acts the god he acts as if it exists right i mean right now I, I would say you know he does bring a certain amount of cultural and civilizational humility to at least point out how hard this thing is and that we have a role to play in it and that if you really analyze yourself one of the things that i think 
I didn't think this for many years, but I, I accept it now, <laughs> especially having a child is you, they're all barbarians. It's your job to civilize them. Like they don't, <laughs> we were just on vacation and one of my brother's best friends says, he brings his child over and he's only 14 months old, but he, my daughter is younger and smaller. And so he just walks up to her and just, you know, boom, slams her down. And you have to teach them. You have to inculcate them that, that like, that's not what we do. And we're sort of trying to play the games that lead to all possible games. Um, that's, that's a difficult proposition when life is so hard and there is a subgroup of people out there who are just malevolent. And as Christians, for a long time, we had this deep humility about who we were. And I, I think that the, you know, the kind of positive psychology that infiltrated the church that, that caused people to say, no, I'm not a worm. I'm not low. Listen, man, I mean, it does, you're not literally a worm. The whole point is that you should recognize that you get it wrong all the time. And as C.S. Lewis said, if I, being who I am and who I know myself to be, can consider myself to be a Christian, I ought to probably cut people some slack. And so I think that losing, we could probably do better than just saying, like, for such a worm as I but I don't know how much better we could do than that. I mean, that seems to be, you know, it gives you some sense of humility so that you approach the world and other people, not assuming you have all the right answers. Yeah. And yeah. what it appears to me as, as other thought leaders, my colleagues, um, they may not want to admit overtly that I can't get through this life without something, something more than what I have. And I refuse to call it a God-shaped vacuum in, in my heart. I'm going to call it social justice. And see, to show you how fast things have changed, when, when I was in my master's program, I was a chair of social justice at LSU. Like, our, our, we were attempting, though, we were trying to get, like, bed nets to people who were suffering from malaria. Like, that's, that was my view of, of social justice. Yeah, so yeah, these yeah. things are happening so fast that yeah, you yeah. being able to disentangle materiality in a world yeah. that's becoming increasingly um, yeah. dematerialized. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's a big, and we'll all be happy to follow along the way and, and read what that you know, looks like, um, cause it's, it's a fascinating journey and I don't, in this space, I hope that what we can try to do is start to reach people that, that they do need something tangible and for, for my own sake, if, I've lived the kind of life where um, there were so many times when I should have given up on God if he were not real. Um, does that mean I'm a perfect believer? So I really do understand what Peterson means with when he did the interview with Bishop Barron. It's the weight of saying that that's so hard because it also means you've got to live a certain way and that hurts. I mean, the, the notion that becoming a Christian is going to mean um, you get a free car, you can name it and claim it, or the thing that I've seen recently, which is the opposite. Like, don't say you have cancer. Don't speak that into existence. Don't. Well, yeah, how do you, yeah, yeah, yeah. how can you deal with the truth then? How yeah, can it really you, worked well for Steve Jobs. Yeah, how can you? how can you get down to what the truth is, speak truth in love and move forward with something that's, that's actually workable for you, a treatment solution. Um, so it's not about the denial of what's happening. Um, the questions, the theodicy questions of suffering, why would a good God allow such things? I mean, I find that I find it compelling 
I liked your video last week where you're like, I'm not buying it because if everything were perfect, you probably still would find a reason to, to reject this. And I completely get that. But let's, let's assume for a minute that I'll just lay all my cards on the table and say, you know, when I, I was studying at Oxford, I was um, studying with one of C.S. Lewis's protege and there and the tutorial system at Oxford, it's so intense. It's just you and that person and you're going at it. And here in the U.S., what I experienced at the university was you go into a class. And so I did, you know, I did the classics approach. I did the, the liberal arts approach from, from my undergrad and didn't listen to my parents who were like, don't do that. It's a bad idea, especially if you go to a name school with, you know, some cachet because you walk into the class and if it's a theology class, the goal is to take a person who's a believer and turn them into a non-believer. And they will state that explicitly. If you're in this class and you have faith, raise your hand. By the end of the semester, you will not. And it's like, wait, what, what is the name of this class? How what is the goal of this? Faith? I thought I was here for a grade and a transcript. <laughs> right. But this is, you know, the elite Harvard, Stanford, Princeton, you know, the, the professors that have chops. And so you as a young moldable mind assume that if they have gotten that certificate, they've gotten that diploma, they've been certified by an institution as prestigious as that, that what they're saying must be true, right? It must be true. Lum they're luminaries in their fields. They have status and we all look at them and, and we all play this game one way or another that elevate them. Yep. Right. And we confer, we confer, it's why, it's why ads work. It's why, yep. Peyton Manning being good at football. Also, he tells you where to go for insurance and you assume that his expertise in a specific domain translates. We actually do that. And so when you hear their voice, you don't even necessarily recognize that's Peyton Manning, but you somehow associate that voice with expertise and you should do this. You should go to, you know, you should buy Omaha steak or whatever it is <laughs> he's putting out there. Um, but then whenever I got to Oxford, it was completely different because you were dealing with people that one of my professors had PhDs in five different fields. Wow. Spoke 15 different languages and also <laughs> taught theology from a different perspective. And I was like, wait a minute, I thought you were supposed to be, you know, knocking, knocking this thing called faith down. And um, so when I was working with Francis Warner, um, he knew Lewis when Lewis lost his wife and it was mm -hmm. just a brutal time and watching someone of immense importance to the faith go through their own trial of faith, um, it had a deep impact on him. And then getting to be associated in some way with that and, and hearing him say, you know, these these textbooks that you're reading, um, that's great, but the intellect without the faith is like, you know, a skeleton without breath. It's just lifeless. And you've got, you, you need to deal with that question yourself. You're going to have to wrestle with that. That um, I didn't know that um some months later my life was going to change because i had this great scholarship that allowed you to travel all over europe you know read the best books be at the best university and um i come from a place where there are more cows than people like <laughs> people when i was growing up they still did this and i was an original migrant worker you know we picked whatever was in season whether it was field things like peas or in the fall, something like that, pecans. You worked in the fields, you did that, and you raised pigs. What the heck am I doing at Oxford? You know, what is a person like this? No one in my family had ever done anything like this. And so I was on top of the world. Everything seemed, it seemed like if prosperity gospel was true, I was living it, right? But <laughs> it's going great. And I just thought that it would be, 
like that for in perpetuity. Your life's just going to keep getting better and better. Yeah. And all perpetuity. because you're so smart to know how to live it right. Unlike all those idiot people in the past. Exactly. And all those other people today. Yes. And, and there, yes, you, it sort of creeps in. It seeps into, I must be doing something right. And so a long story short, I, when I got back for my Christmas break, um, I was invited back to do my, my grad studies there at Oxford. And man, I came down with what my physicians called the perfect storm of illness. It's just a conglomeration of various things that hit something knocked my immune system out. And then once it did, I got attacked by all of these viruses and I got this horrible form of pneumonia and I was absolutely bedridden for three and a half years. I lived in isolation. Like I, could, I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't, I couldn't even really speak. Um, I had to sign over a power of attorney to my parents so that they could negotiate things with our insurance company. And the thing is, there were days whenever I would look, um, you know, just be staring at the ceiling. And when I would wake up, it was like a groundhog day of suffering every day. It was the same thing. And so I would say, you know, God, I don't know whether or not I'm going to praise you or curse you today. But it'll probably be one of those two things. You know? um, but the fact that what my physicians ended up telling me after all of this happened is the greatest miracle is not that you are better now. It's that you somehow survived in a state of extreme deprivation where there's not really a good explanation for that. And so... Again, I came to academia with trying to answer some questions that I had for like, what is the nature of existence? Like how, how I experienced states of consciousness that a lot of other people have not and will not until they're on their way out. And there were so many times where I had those close calls that I would be lying to you if I said it wasn't scary and frightful. But for someone who was as young as me, there was no, I had no roadmap for this. Yeah. And yeah. so you, know, you, have, you meet with a lot of people that are, that are wrestling with decisions and I'm not a preacher, so I'm not gonna have an altar call right here, but I'm just saying like, <laughs> if you think your life is going great, and it is, <laughs> Enjoy it. Be happy. Enjoy it. Be but. happy. But <laughs> no one has beaten Father Time yet. Like you will run out of negative entropy at some point. And, and game over. And so if it's not the suffering itself, bodily or psychologically, then existentially. And so we've given our youth, nothing to deal with that. Nihilism, let me tell you something. When you are racked by pain and you can't leave and you can't see anyone and you can't speak, you can't walk. I was a college athlete. That's how I paid for my education. I was working out and playing tennis four hours a day, um, every day to go from that and traveling around the world to not being able to go to the bathroom on my own and having like, you know, my parents spoon feeding me again. Um, it, it makes you realize that life happens in such a way it unfolds itself in a way that you couldn't, you couldn't ever predict. Um, but that, in those moments, you become more who you are. You become like your real self is revealed. And um, the amount of people that prayed for me, the amount of people that wished me well. Um, see, rather than having a problem of evil, I think we have, I think if you're not a person of faith, then you have a problem of goodness. Yeah. The problem of goodness is inextricable to me. 
because there's no explanation for why even when I was suffering as extremely as I was, why I felt the mercy of God, why I felt compassion, why other people cared about me at all. And you can look, there's only so far you can push this thing and say, well, altruism is an outflow of selective pressures so that we would commune with one another and not kill one another. Okay. But there's, there's still a problem of goodness that you could experience moments of reverie and lyrical moments with God, even in the midst of that kind of suffering. Um, so for me, it's just, look, on day one, nihilism failed. Like, it yeah. didn't do me yeah. any, okay, so nothing's over and then I die, okay, awesome. Like, then we're already here. And so the question really is, start had it right, or Camus, both of them. Like, why not end your life then? That's right. Why, you know, extend the amount of suffering you're going to do if, yeah. if in the end it doesn't matter anyway. Yeah. I'd say that's the wrong level of analysis um, that there would have been no way equally to predict that I'd be where I am now, that I would have a wife who's just out of my league in every way and, you know, a baby that uh, makes every moment of that suffering worth it. Mm. Um, there were things that I get to experience on the other side of it. And maybe, maybe there are people, you know, that you, you speak with that, that isn't the way it fell for them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. there's no comfort there in yeah. the sense that they didn't get better. There's no recovery narrative. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I've experienced that, you know, in the life of my family as well. Yeah. And, there'll come a day when there will be no recovery narrative for me. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's a really grim thing, but I think we've done such a disservice. Yeah. And Burbank, he tells some, some hilarious, that's hilarious to me, stories about, you know, his, his kid and his kid's friends, like not having what you would think of as like the kind of existential resiliency to go through problems that you, you would think wouldn't ruin somebody. These, we've just done them such a disservice by not having any kind of foundation for them yep. um, at all. And yep. so I love the fact that you're trying to rebuild that scaffolding that says, okay, then we're not reading a book of outdated cosmology. It's a different kind of narrative here. Um, but I'd be interested for the people that, that I interact with, the students that I interact with, what would you tell them? What's the place of the Bible? Like what, what would you say to them if they say, then, you know, what do I, what do, I do with this book? Yeah. yeah, it's so funny because as a preacher, I'm supposed to be able to answer that and just kind of lay it down there. <laughs> yes, you are. That's what you get paid the, the big bucks for. <laughs> yeah, the, the truth is in my experience, I mean, ironically, people often ask me, it's often parents whose children have gone a bit astray. How can I get my child to watch Jordan Peterson? And it's like, well, this is a Christian family asking me how they can get their kid to watch Jordan Peterson. How can I get my kid to watch your videos? And I usually say, eh, don't bother trying. Um, if they, you know, and what I tell people all the time is, I mean, the most powerful, this is, there's absolutely nothing new about any of this. It is so, it is so completely unoriginal. That, that it almost bears not saying, but it's almost always the most obvious things that need the most repetition, which is you need to, you need to be, you need to, you need to be the thing that you want them to be. That there's nothing more we can do. I mean, it's, it's Jesus at the, at the beginning of the book of Acts and you will be my witnesses. The whole, you know, the, um, the, the disciples ask him, when, when will God restore the kingdom to Israel? Which a lot of Christians read that and they're like, what kind of question is that? Well, that was actually the question that was on the mind of the disciples throughout the gospels that Jesus and the disciples just keep butting heads and Jesus and everybody keeps butting heads over this question in the gospels. When will you restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus doesn't answer the question. 
he says, uh, you will receive power when the Holy Cut Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in, in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And, well, that's a funny answer, too, <laughs> right. especially because, you know, I often tell people, well, if you, if you live the life of Jesus, you'll get what Jesus got. And people who have some of this sort of this romantic idea about who Jesus was think, oh, that sounds lovely. And then if they read the Bible at all, they'll say, oh, wait a minute, I don't want to get what he got. He seemed to have a fairly reasonable life until he starts this crazy ministry. Then he lives, lives for three years, seems to really tick a lot of people off to the degree that in the midst of a raging culture war, political adversaries can only agree upon the fact that the world would be better if they shut him up by killing him. Uh, that doesn't sound like a success strategy, but that's exactly what happened. And well, he had friends around him. Yeah, but they pretty much all ran away except for the politically insignificant people around him, which were the women and the youth, who were the only ones who dared to show up at Golgotha to watch him die. And of that, the only words they remembered him saying apparently did not include, oh, in three days I'm going to rise from the dead, which was probably the craziest among all the other crazy undiscernible things he said to the degree that the only people showing up on the tomb were the third on the third day were a bunch of women who had the dirty work of embalming an already smelly corpse. So, you know, the whole story is just nuts. <laughs> and yes. so if you really want to, if you really want to, to, to riff on Jordan Peterson a little bit, if you really want to, if you really believe that stuff and you want to share it with someone else, the, the only thing, the best thing you can probably do is act as if it's true. And, and maybe along the way with all your yapping, you'll say something that's of some use to someone, and it'll probably be accidental. I mean, it's at that level that we human beings actually live. It really is. Mm -hmm. And so, well, there you have it. You want to be of help? Why don't you begin by being like Jesus? You'll do a bad job of it, and you'll probably mess things up, but and this is why, you know, people, well, are you going to become Orthodox? Or, well, it's like, hey, I'm a Protestant. Why? I'm a Calvinist. Very happy in my tradition. And what I'm happy about my tradition is that we're finally saved. Paul Vanderclay is finally saved, not by his ability to mimic Jesus, but by Jesus' ability to rescue this idiot. And I'd much rather have my hope on Jesus' capacity than my own. And so that's why I remain as I am. And so that's, you know, I'm in, in many ways, people don't believe me when I say, in many ways, I'm a very simple man. I have simple tastes. And when it comes to my religion, it's pretty simple. That if I have to choose on who's doing the rescuing, me or Jesus, I'd <laughs> rather trust in him than trust in me. Sure. And that's, to me, the bottom line. So when people are like, well, what can I do to be helpful? Well, why don't, you, why don't you learn a little bit about who Jesus is and start acting like him? And maybe in a moment where I think it completely lines up with my latest videos, with how we instinctively respond as people, you might try talking to him. And I know it's a little crazy, and it's so funny because when you get into a Christian worship service, people are nitpicking about, well, it's this style of music or that style of music or these words or that words. Well, in this secular frame, it's just completely nuts that we're all singing songs to what we represent as a man in the sky and hoping he talks back. And a lot of the lovely little old ladies who have had a whole lot of suffering in their lives say things like, well, Jesus answers prayer. And all of us skeptical, educated people say, well, I'm not so sure. Yeah, but that little old lady has suffered and lived and done a whole lot of things that some of us young, smart people, you know, have for all of the books that we've read. Eh, the truth is, we don't know a lot. I like your skeleton illustration. So we do not know very much at all. And, and the kind of limits that we have, what is available for us to know is also constrained by the fact that um, I had written this uh, $12 million grant that the federal government um, it accepted and funded over four years to make sure that people in rural areas were getting the array of services that they needed um, for treatment. And 
um, looking at that, doing study and finding out, you know, why are these, why are so many people who are so young struggling so mightily with mental health um, and having like the worst diagnoses out there? And so while working for the government, it's just wild the kind of things that you would see that like studies would be embargoed uh, that I'm not trying to start a conspiracy theory. What I'm trying to say is that incompetence and malevolence are real and that if you have a self-interest and there's a report or a study that's been commissioned that's going to make you look bad during an election period, you put the kibosh on it. But what happens is you're never fully in touch with what scientists would consider up-to-date truth. And so I'm, I'm dealing in the midst of, of two cases right, right now. The first one was, um, I won't say his name because he's a prominent researcher at a prominent university and he came down with leukemia. And it just so happens that he's a research oncologist. <laughs> And so the kind of leukemia that he has, there was no hope for him based on the current model of treatment. And so it happens to be the case that I was working with another physician putting together a study that looked at the transmission of a particular disease through parent to child. Um, was there a vertical transmission? That's what I, that's the only way I came to know this guy. And he shared his data with me that um, because he had access to a lab and because he was an N of one, he could really just test himself to the nth degree. And so he put himself on a different type of drug regimen than anyone else would have. And what the data shows is, well, one, he's still alive. And this has been probably about five years running. And that every data point as his numbers would would get worse he would interject another medication of this type and boom it would respond so there's a clear dose response and when i asked him I was like why are you using why are you reaching out to you know piddly nobodies you know at at a state school to look at your stats and things of that nature and he was like listen we're it's just a fact that we happen to be funded by pharmaceutical companies. That's who funds a lot of our research. Nobody wants to see the fact that this alternative approach worked. And I'm not talking about cures they don't want you to know about. This is not, you know, some kind of homeopathic remedy book or something like that. I'm actually talking about a leading research scientist up against existence with no possible chance to live. So he tried something novel and it worked. Yep. yep. Um, but yep. And it might not work for anybody else or everyone, but. Right. It yep. worked for him. It's an N of one and it's in interesting and important research. Yep. But he's been shut down by the research community. Yep. Which yep. is interesting that, that scapegoating and blasphemy laws have sort of been, been reinstituted but it's precisely at those places that the common person feels that they have no argument against. Yep. It's in yep. the realms of science, it's in the realms of philosophy where um, some of this is taking place, but if you don't know it, you don't know it. Yep. So yep. I, I think they're making the, the smarter Pascal's wager. They're, yep. they're putting their money on the right thing. Yep. Um, because the, the truth that you never have informed consent, really. You never really know the truth. No, nope. um, no. Nope. So I think we've done, not that we can't do better, but we've done about as good a job as we can yep. to this point and yep. much room left to go. And yep. so um, I have to, we have to land the plane here, Kyle, because I got, I got some stuff I got to do and I got another conversation in about five minutes. So, and the, yeah. the, but the, the lady that runs the childcare centers called me twice. So it's like, Oh, homeless person, a uh, building <laughs> problem, uh, a clogged toilet. You know, that's, that's the, that's the scope of my life. <laughs> that's, 
as we say in the biz, handle your scandal. Pastor That's right. Clay. Is well, that this has been a delight, Kyle. I'm going to send you this video and you look at it and, and then we can decide what we do with it. All right. So, so wonderful to spend some time with you. Yeah, this was a delight, Kyle. We should talk again. All right. Sure thing. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.